Okay, what's up, guys? Um, I'm Krish. <laughs> so, guys, I'm Anish. This is Krish. Uh, we're part of the <laughs> RSC team. Um, unfortunately, due to some last minute cancellations, we weren't able to have a COVID scientist at hand uh, to talk to you guys. But we're hoping we came up with this presentation. Um, we're hoping that can provide you some insight that you've been looking for about the current pandemic and maybe help redirect some of your thoughts about the Makerthon submissions that you guys are doing. So, um, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoy it. This presentation will be about 45 to 50 minutes, um, pretty lengthy. And at the end, we'll have time to answer any questions by going on our Discord. So let's get started. Um, thank you guys for taking the time. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, so just quick introductions. I'm Chris Chain. I'm Director of Operations here at Redmond STEM Center. I am a junior at Redmond High School this year, and I'm really excited. I'm really passionate about biology, and uh, I hope uh, that you learn a lot from what we're going to go over today. Yeah, for sure. My name is Anisha, as I mentioned. I'm just part of the RSC team. I'm also a junior at Redmond High. I've been passionate about biology for uh, as long as I can remember, really. Um, Chris and I both do a number of clubs related to biology and the sciences in general, including Knowledge Bowl, Science Bowl. Um, and uh, we have both uh, we're occur currently or have taken AP Bio. And I, I think we can provide some sort of credibility. While it may not be the same level as a scientist, uh, this is a well-researched PowerPoint. So let's get started. Okay, so um, short background on the pandemic, so COVID-19. So coronavirus or COVID, um, it started in December, 2019. That sounds so long ago, but it started in Wuhan, China. And the virus that causes disease is actually named SARS-CoV-2, even though the disease itself is called COVID. Um, and what COVID stands for is the CO stands for the corona, the crown shape on the virus. Um, the V stands for virus and the D stands for disease. So that's a little etymology behind the name. And the case fatality is highest in ages 85 plus. And you can see, um, you can see right there, that's why we often refer to elderly people who suffer the most from this pandemic. Um, so what is the coronavirus? What does SARS-CoV-2 mean? Um, again, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes this pandemic and COVID is the name of the disease. So, one second, sorry. Okay, perfect. So let's continue. Um, so on March 11th, the WHO, the World Health Organization, declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic, meaning it stretched out of the 196 recognized countries. It stretched to over 100 of them. Um, right now, I think it's in 186 out of 192 countries. Um, so this is a chart of right here on the left of the weekly deaths from the CDC um, until November uh, that we have. And you can see that it spiked right around uh, mid-April. A uh, crazy number right here. We're having around 16K weekly deaths. Uh, some of the common fevers, as you guys know, uh, some of the common symptoms that you guys know are, you know, fevers, sore throat, shortness of breath, and uh, among other respiratory diseases, um, anosmia or the loss of smell or the, and the loss of taste is unique among COVID. So that might that might be something a little interesting to you guys. So we've talked a little bit about COVID, but this is some brief information that I'm sure most of our viewers know because it pertains to the importance of the pandemic. Uh, right now, Krish will go over some of the detailed mechanisms, the biological aspects of how the COVID virus works. Yeah, so I'm sure many of you guys have heard how a virus works. In general, a virus can actually reproduce by itself, right? It has to attach to the surface of a cell, inject its own DNA, and can then get that cell to reproduce its DNA for it and get to reproduce for it. So when we're talking specifically about COVID, there are three main surface proteins that help this virus bind to that surface of the cell. Um, and we're going to go over all of these in a little bit of detail. Um, the envelope protein, which we short call the E protein, hemoglobin and esterase, which is found on the influenza virus as well. Um, influenza is a common cold. It's a very common virus. Um, and the spike proteins. And so spike proteins are probably the most researched and the most relevant to the virus's incredible infectivity. Um, And the spike protein as well is going to be important to the vaccination efforts, as we'll see later on. Exactly. Um, and so spike proteins recognize and bind to the human cells angiotensin converting enzyme surface protein. So an enzyme for all of you guys that don't know is a, essentially a type of protein that helps catalyze reactions, um, makes a lot of the human reactions go quicker. And so what is ACE2 responsible for? It's a transmembrane protein, but in lungs, GI tract, kidney, and blood vessels. Um, and the reason is you can see some of the earlier symptoms we talked about, shortness of breath, things like that, there's a reason is because the COVID, vaccine, uh, the COVID virus attacks the lungs. And because it attacks the lungs, there's shortness of breath, um, the kidney, there's a lot of these common problems that we've seen. Um, and that's sort of the main, 
the main uh, vehicle by which COVID affects us humans. Chris, I also just wanted to add on the left, you can see an image in SEM of the COVID vaccine. And you can kind of see that crown shape and how it does, uh, derives that etymology. So it kind of does look like a crown, always interesting to see. So angiotensin two, ang two for short, is a blood pressure raising hormone in the renin angiotensin under aldosterone system. Um, and this system is essentially uh, responsible for regulating blood pressure throughout the human body. Um, and it involves a series of modifications to the angiotensin hormone uh, until it comes co in contact with ACE2, which transforms it then into angiotensin 1-7. And angiotensin 1-7 is then responsible for lowering blood pressure. And so after modifying H2 into H1-7, the ACE2 protein then changes structures. And spike proteins are only able to bind to this unaltered ACE2 protein, uh, which will be really important when we talk about the vaccine later in the future. Uh, and so angiotensin is released from the liver, angiotensin 1 and ACE, uh, they combine in the lungs and form angiotensin 2, and then these are all responsible for uh, regulating uh, like the pituitary gland, uh, vasculoconstriction, blood pressure, all these things that are really important for the human body. Okay, so uh, going next. Uh, the symptom variation. Wait, Anish, can you go to the next? Oh, pardon me. Did you already talk? Oh, no. Pardon me. Yeah, that's good. So, symptom variation among different cases can mainly be explained by the different amount of ACE2 protein in people's bodies. Um, healthy individuals, so I'd say much younger age people, have lower blood pressure, have higher H2, and they have more altered ACE2, right? So, with this more altered ACE2, there's a lot less unaltered ACE2 that the spike proteins in the coronavirus can bind to. And it produces H17 at much higher rates. Um, and you can see here that this, the main symptoms I talked about earlier, I mean, I need to talk about earlier, cough, fever, chills, they're associated with a lot of the organs that the COVID, um, the COVID vaccine, I mean, the COVID coronavirus tends to target. Um, and a lot of it, it reduces the virus's access to the cells, right? When you get into older individuals, they're gonna have a lot more of that unaltered H2 um, because their body just runs a bit slower. And because they have that greater quantity of H2, there's now more cells for this coronavirus to act on, which is why it's so uh, detrimental to especially higher age population. Um, a big issue with some of the earlier virus, like the Spanish flu, was that they targeted a lot of younger age individuals. And um, that's obviously way more concerning for the world population as opposed to COVID. Um, I think which was one of, um, one of I guess, the reliefs that it, would, it stayed away from children because that could be very detrimental to humans. Okay, so uh, like I talked about earlier, unhealthy individuals have more ACE2 and therefore the protein is able to bind it. And especially those with sedentary lifestyles or higher blood pressure, like we talked about earlier, this angiotensin system is responsible for regulating blood pressure. If you have higher blood pressure, you're sedentary, you are missing a lot of that, you have a lot of that unaltered ACE2 um, and it prevents the proteins from creating ANG17 to reduce that blood pressure. Uh, and this sort of explains some of the main symptoms, um, respiratory distress, renal failure, the failure of the kidney, uh, and liver, GI distress, stroke, blood clots, all these things provide a lot of the explanation for some of the detrimental effects of COVID. Um, and because there's so many wide variety of symptoms, COVID-19 has a lot of different options to spread through the body. A lot of the reasons it can be really dangerous, you can go through the nose, the mouth, um, just it lives on surfaces, all these things transmitting to other hosts. This is why sort of something we we're gonna talk about earlier is why the r naught value of this virus is so high, why it can spread from person to person so quickly. Um, and I guess one sort of relieving thing about this is at least the relative um, mortality rate is relatively low when you compare it to something like Ebola. But um, the fact that it spread so fast is why uh, a rapid response to this was so necessary. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much. I think Chris beautifully explained uh, the detailed mechanisms of how uh, the COVID, vi uh, COVID virus enters the cell. And if, again, just to provide a little recap, the reason why uh, unhealthy unhealthy individuals or elder, uh, elderly individuals are disproportionately affected uh, by this virus is because of the ACE2 protein, which they have less of. Um, and, you know, this comes with uh, other health concerns like lower blood, uh, blood vessels and pressure. Pardon me. Okay, so um, so it's entered the cell. We've established that. Now, how does it make people sick? 
one second. I think my PowerPoint's okay. So let's enter the cell. How does it make people sick? Okay. So um, the basic structure of a virus, right? So it's protected by a structural protein, and it has a single strand of RNA of genetic information that's only 26 kilobytes of data. That's pretty small in uh, biology. Um, the coronavirus uses uh, the cell's organelles, like all viruses, to copy its genetic information and to produce itself. And it'll increase itself in the same protein that it produces. So um, this is this is the, uh, in the diagram of the COVID's genetic material. You can see this blue is the protein capsid. The red is the spike proteins or the transmembrane proteins that it attaches to. And the yellow is an RNA, is the genetic information that it uh, sends out. So, so two thirds of the RNA consists of two large open frames, which encodes 16 non-structural proteins. Okay, what does that mean? That means that open large reading frames are the reading frames which are actually read by the, uh, by the, by the um, cell that it invades. So out of the, in the genetic material, there's obviously some DNA that has to encode um, that's just done to, you know, kind of masquerade the virus. And then these two large open frames are the ones that the cell actually reads and uses to produce the protein. So these non-structural proteins aren't the envelope proteins or the membrane proteins. These proteins are actually forming a viral replicase complex, which replicates the viral mRNA. So the virus, the, the human cell that the virus invades doesn't actually have the factory it's in itself to produce the viral RNA. So it's kind of complex when you think about it. This COVID enters your cell, it enters the DNA to set up a factory, and then it also sets up the DNA needed to build the factory. Kind of long process, I don't know, for this little little 26 kilobases of data. So some proteins of this viral replicase complex includes RNA polymerase, which you guys might recognize as using to build uh, RNA, proteases, which are uh, enzymes which cut proteins, helicase, another one in common you know, translation, which uh, is unwinds the helicase, and primase, which allows for, you know, uh, the starting of a primer for Okazaki fragments. Um, so those are some common proteins you might be familiar with, which are included in this uh, viral replication complex. So the other one third of the COVID genomes includes open for reading frames, which produces the actual structural proteins. So you have the you have the factory which produces the genetic information for the virus, and then you have the other proteins which produces the protein coat. Um, they make up the spike glycoproteins, the membrane proteins, and the small envelope proteins as well. It also includes this other accessory proteins, which suppress the immune system, and we'll see how these work, these accessory proteins work in their immune reaction to come. So to rephrase, we have um, one large genetic information, RNA, that's stored. Uh, it's rather small if you think about it, but it does a lot. It encodes, it sets up the factory, it sets up the factory and the instructions it needs to actually produce the DNA, and then it produces the actual case and all the other uh, structural components of COVID. Okay. So after replication, these viral structures are going to move to the end plasma reticulum and to the Golgi apparatus, where they're going to form mature virions. And this is just basically common to all, uh, all viral structures. And uh, the M protein from replication, one of the main factors in direct and protein interactions and assembly uh, of the coronavirus. So during this replication, it also produces this M protein, which allows for this to happen. Uh, I think the main takeaway from this is that you're seeing the COVID, the COVID virus is consistently having to produce its own mechanisms needed in the cell. Whereas you might think, oh, it's just a small thing. It enters the cell and then it uses the cell's own technology or machinery to go against itself. Yes, it does do that, but it's consistently making its own machinery because the cell just doesn't have it. The cell doesn't have M protein. It doesn't have this viral replicase complex. Um, so after this virion is fully assembled in the cell, this is, an ex this is a diagram of exocytosis. Um, this is what it looked like. Um, it's then expelled out uh, from the cell and this lysis kind of kills the cell, explodes the cell. And okay. I think something, sorry, sorry to interrupt. But no, on go ahead, side, go ahead. I think for those who maybe don't remember what ER is, on the rough ER, remember there, there are the ribosomes that are sort of dot, speckled across the rough ER. And with these ribosomes, the virus is able to use its uh, DNA it's able to get the ribosomes to convert this DNA into proteins for it, right? And then after it's done being sort of created or synthesized at the endoplasmic reticulum, it's taken out the Golgi apparatus to be packaged and all those things. And so that's how that it, sort of the, I guess, the basic overview of how, how all viruses take their DNA, convert to protein, then convert to be packaged, and now it's sort of ready to be, I don't know, it's another mature vir virion. Yeah, another about. mature virion, exactly, perfect. And uh, one part of the, you know, how it kind of kills these cells is, um, it produces these viruses inside the cell and then they kind of explode out and that's kind of how the cells die. 
that's just common cell viruses. But we thought we'd review that because it's important to COVID. Just to understand for those who don't might not have as in the depth or might not remember um, how viruses work. Okay, so we talked about how it enters the cell. Some of the genetic genetic code information. Let's talk about COVID 19s unique suppression of the immune system, and this is what's really interesting to me. So we talked a little bit about the accessory frames, which are coded by the last opening frame. The COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, blocks one aspect of the body's immune system, yet allows another response to proliferate. And this is not seen with other viruses. So pretend that we have two arms in this virus, you know, arm A and arm B. Um, other viruses, such as SARS, other old viruses, such as SARS and influenza, they start to interfere with both arms of the body immune system. And, you know, this kind of makes sense, right? So if you have two ways of, you know, um, of de defending yourself, right? You have a wall and a moat, for example, you're gonna wanna try to disable both of them. COVID though, allows one to stay up and this is how it actually delivers its damaging blow. Okay, so first one, uh, our two defenses of our body's immune system. This is kind of a rough overview. So first one, we have the call to arms and that's these infected cells. They're gonna produce molecules called interferons, signaling molecules that spread all across your bloodstream. And they're gonna tell your nearby cells to activate over 500 of their own genes and they'll slow down viral replication if they're infected. Um, so now if one cell is infected, it's gonna tell all the other cells, hey, I have some immune, some pathogen in my body. I don't know what it is. You guys have to stop slowing down replication no matter what it is. It's kind of a fail safe. Okay, then we have the call to reinforcement. These infected cells also secrete proteins called chemokines, which set off, off, off an alarm in the body's immune system. And they're going to draw in these killer antibody cells. Um, they're antibody making B cells and the virus killing T cells to the source. And these are the professional killers of the virus. So one, we have reinforcement. They're saying, you know what, immune system, you send out your killers. You help me. I'm infected. And then we have the call to arms. It's saying, you know what, we have, I'm infected. All of you guys, you better shut down. We don't want this thing to spread at all. Okay, so how does COVID interfere with these two? We talked about how it blocks one and doesn't block another. So it blocks the call to arms response, but it encourages the call to reinforcement defense. So interferons, which are dampening this virus's ability to replicate, they're blocked. So nothing's preventing the virus from replicating without any interference from the immune system. Those, signal, those signaling molecules, which are sent out to nearby cells, those aren't sent out. So now, so now there's really no way of the virus to stop, and it can just go from one cell hopping around like that. Yet it does this, but it doesn't shut down this call to reinforcement. These chemokines, which are, uh, which, which are sent out, they're not suppressed. And macrophages, neutrophils, an array of immune cells are everywhere. And they're causing unchecked inflammation. Inflammation is the body's way of combating uh, a lot of uh, pathogens and virus diseases. It, you might know it as raising the temperature. Um, and that's how it kind of, uh, that's how it kills these viruses cells. Um, and these immune cells, when they come, they, they just cause inflammation. Um, um, they cause they cause inflammation. Um, too much inflammation can obviously be bad, right? In inflammation hurts the human cells, but the goal is, you know, it's we're going to hurt the human cells, but it's it's a cost and benefit. We're going to kill the viruses, even though we hurt the human cells. But if you keep calling your reinforcement, this hyperinflammation caused by there being way too many immune cells in the area, remember, it's it's encouraging this call to reinforcement defense. It's called a cytokine storm, and it's deadly. It can it can kill because it raises the temperature so much. It causes too much inflammation. So there you go, encourages the call to reinforcement defense, kind of a little um, cytokine storm, sounds like a Valorant alt agent, <laughs> um, a cytokine storm. Okay, so now Chris is going to talk a little bit about uh, the statistics behind COVID. Yeah, so I think I talked about this a little bit earlier, but when we talk about how is Ebola, like why is COVID caused all this shutdown? We've dealt with Ebola, we've dealt with other viruses in the past, what makes COVID special? And so I think there's a couple key statistical terms that we need to talk about before we start to get into this. Um, the first is serial interval, um, which is essentially if you have one person who's infected with COVID-19, how long does it take for another, a new person to get it, for this one person to transmit it to another? And for COVID-19, that, that number is approximately 3.96 days, um, which compared to other viruses relatively is very, very low. It's very quick. Um, and then next we talk about r not value, which is how often, how much does one infected person, how, much, how many other people does one infected person infect? That's 5.7. That's huge, right? Think about it. Like, you're in, if you if I have the virus, I'm infected six, five other of my friends, and a little bit more than that, right? That's kind of insane. Um, and if you think about it, if you have one, right? If I'm infecting, I'm infecting this one other person. The virus is being stable. If it's above one, the virus is rapidly growing. If it's less than one, then we're causing the virus to get that, go down. At the time, we're actually very behind the curve, right? Um, and so, some uh, statistical models that predict virality, um, SIR which is susceptible, infected, and recovered. Um, and so how this virus model works essentially 
is you have the susceptible, right? Those are people who are still unaffected. Um, and then you have infected who are currently affected and actively spreading the virus and you have recovered. And you can see why each of those different peoples needs to be treated a bit differently, right? If you have, for example, the infected people and they're recovered, they're gonna uh, be a lot less susceptible to getting the virus again and being, they're gonna recover much faster, faster because their cell already has the necessary antibodies um, and the antigens. And we can talk, we're gonna talk about that a little bit earlier. Um, I know we hear the terms antigens, antibodies a lot um, that our cells developing that, but what exactly does that mean? Um, that's something we're gonna cover a bit later. Um, but if you think about susceptible or sort of the new, um, infected or those who currently have it, uh, are recovered and sort of we bunch those three into one category, we're able to treat each of them independently and get a really accurate model of where, where COVID is going. Um, and last is mortality rates. I think a really interesting trend, we talked about earlier how um, uh, COVID is related to age, especially mortality rates, you can see Mexican mortality rate is almost 10%, um, and India is almost 1.5%. And some of the reasons you can notice these trends is the mean average age. Look at the age, the average age in India, it's about 26, 27. That's pretty young, right? So everyone who's being affected by the virus is not necessarily dying because of it. But if you look at Mexico, it is much higher and it's causing a lot more deaths. Um, and if you look, th this is a bit of an outdated figure, uh, but this talks about the big differences in skills of, in the scale of the outbreak. Um, and obviously the U.S. is still at the top, um, but I think a lot of good things are, are happening out in relation to that. Okay, so now let's get into a little bit of how these vaccine works. So just a basic overview, I think we need to explain how does our immune system work? Um, there's three main types of cells that I'd like to talk about. Uh, there's macrophages, uh, which follow up bacteria through phagocytosis. What is phagocytosis? Uh, phagocytosis is essentially en enveloping a cell. You can think of um, the cell sort of distort the, the cell, um, cell membrane sort of distorts its shape, envelops itself around the cell and grabs it into its own, in, its own thing. And then now the lysosomes, which are sort of the cleaners of the cell are responsible for, for sort of degrading it. And it leaves behind essential parts called antigens, right? Antigens are like chunks of proteins. You can think of them uh, Chunks of proteins identical to the one born by the pathogen. So the body can stimulate, recognize and stimulate antibodies in the future by recognizing these antigens. Um, and then there's B lymphocytes, which are defensive white blood cells that produce antibodies. T lymphocytes, which are other defense cells that sort of kill infected ones. Um, they're sort of like the exterminators of the cell. And so these T lymphocytes, the reason why these, uh, I guess when, when the virus comes back, why vaccines are so effective, T lymphocytes are kept as like memory cells. And what I mean by that is that a few T lymphocytes are kept in the body. So the, bell, the body can replicate the response, right? Vaccines can produce, provide these, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes time to develop every time you have it. And this normally takes a few weeks. That's why even after a few weeks after vaccination, you're still kind of susceptible. You're still a little bit susceptible to what's happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, great job, Krish. No. Okay, cool. Is that going to the next? Pardon me. Yeah, let's, let's move on. I... Sorry, I'm just kind of called tabs. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna sort of cover the four different types of, uh, four different types of vaccines. The main four different types are mRNA vaccines, uh, which are sort of the new novel type you've heard about recently in the news. You've heard a lot of probably how COVID vaccines are this new novel type of thing because they're mRNA vaccines. And what an mRNA vaccine is, is it injects a harmless protein. What we talked about earlier with the virus, the viral vector sort of coming into the body um, and using the RefVR, the ribosomes, the Golgi apparatus, the cell's sort of central dogma to replace it, to turn its own DNA to RNA. What these mRNA vaccines do is they inject a harmless protein from the COVID strain and they let it replicate, right? They let it replicate over and over. And so it's kind of ironic how they inject the protein into the cell is through a virus. It's, called, it's actually called the adenovirus. Um, and they inject this harmless protein and it let it replicate, right? And the body is now able to recognize the genetic code of this coronavirus, right? And so now it can recognize and adequately respond the next time it's actually infected. Um, and the next is a protein subunit. This one just includes a protein. Instead of the mRNA, which is so goes through the whole central dogma process, it just includes the protein. And when any sort of, uh, when, when the cell sees anything that's not foreign, the immune system immediately pounces on it, it sort of attacks. So it includes the protein that causes COVID and then the body starts to create responses to those. And I'd say the most common sort of uh, vaccine that we've seen in, seen in the past is a vector vaccine. That was the very first polio vaccine created by Jonas Salk was actually a vector vaccine. Um, it's a weakened version of the virus. 
Um, and it's through a viral vector. They sort of remove, they, they do some gene editing, some DNA editing, and they remove a lot of the harmful parts of the virus. And then when you put it into the cell, um, the body is able to develop a much more effective response. So sometimes that's why you'll see sometimes people still get symptoms from, from vaccines. Sometimes some people are still affected, um, especially older people, um, because they, their, their immune system still sometimes can handle that weakened version. Um, and then sometimes people also, they just inject the full version of the vaccine. That's also, it's much less common. I think it was a much older technique um, and it's not very workable to this day, but just for, uh, I guess, completeness, I, I want to include that. Yeah, I mean, it, it would suck, right? Like back then, if you had smallpox, they try to, you know, um, just insert smallpox and like, you know, your body will figure it out and then we'll see how it is. But uh, as Chris pointed out, uh, the vector vaccine, which was the initial initial method of trying to vaccinate people, which was in, inserting a weakened virus of the virus, they, a weakened version of the virus, they don't want to try that with COVID. Um, what they're going to do is that they're going to break up COVID into parts and they're going to try inserting these parts instead, instead of the whole thing. So the mRNA does the mRNA from COVID. The protein includes a protein, the structure of protein. So I'll let Chris continue. All right, cool. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit, let's get into some current vaccine models. I'm sure you, you guys have heard a lot about Moderna, Pfizer, all those things. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this. So the new mRNA vaccines, what exactly, I've said they replicate some kind of harmless protein. Why do they replicate? Which one do they replicate in COVID and why? So the one that they replicate is the spike protein. So the one we talked about would be really relevant earlier. And they're critical, but easy to attack. And the reason they're critical it's to really rely on the surface of the virus, right? So the, the first thing that's detected is this spike protein by the, by I guess our immune cells, our lymphocytes. And so having a protein that's on the surface is really effective to mobilize a really, really quick response. And so how exactly are these transmitted, right? How do we, I just said that whenever we have any foreign material, the immune system attacks it, right? So how are we getting this mRNA uh, into our cell? And so the main thing is there's these fat nano, nanoscale uh, mobile particles. And so they are instantly destroyed, but you can sort of think of it as um, like they're like a shielding, a coating, a sort of buttery coating, a lipid coating around the, uh, around the, around the mRNA. And it's, it's the reason that it has to be sort of sh such a low temperature, because often if it was at a higher temperature, this butter would all like, you could think, I think butter is a good analogy because it sort of melts across. It wouldn't be super effective. And so each of these different companies like Pfizer and Moderna, which are the two mRNA vaccines, um, they have to store at different temperatures because they have different fat uh, nanoscale formulations, you can think of them. So Pfizer needs negative 100 and Moderna needs about negative four. And these vaccines have been proven really effective about up to 95% efficacy, um, which I think is really, really cool. So what I'm hearing, Chris, is that they use fat because the immune system won't target fat, but they will target RNA. Exactly. It's like a coating for the, a, for the a mask, a, a ma they're masquerading in. Exactly. So let's talk about a couple of the other ones, uh, sort of outlining, I think about these different vaccines, vaccines, COVID, what, I guess, I talk about mRNA, how do protein subunits apply? How do these vectoral uh, weakened viruses apply? So AstraZeneca uses that vector vaccine, which is the, I guess, the weakened version. It uses adenovirus uh, to inject this, like I talked about earlier, to inject its um, DNA, it's the weakened virus into, uh, into the cell. And so I, I'm not sure if you guys know how this works, but uh, this is also what's used for gene editing a lot of the time. It's what scientists do is they create a virus, they inject DNA into it, the DNA or the genes that they want the cell to replicate. And by doing this now, it's, I guess the cell now is replicating the genes that it wants, right? Um, if it doesn't detect it, it's now replicating exactly what you want, now it's adapting. And so the reason is this took about six months um, it's cheaper, but it's a much slower process, which is why you heard things like Moderna and Pfizer coming out a bit earlier. Um, Janssen uses a vector vaccine. It's a recombinant vector vaccine, which means it uses some different uh, evolutionary types of adenovirus. You use an adenovirus 26 um, and the regular adenovirus. And so it was just was the same. Adenovirus is actually the thing using Ebola, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and finally, we have Novavax. Novavax uh, uses an insect virus called the baculovirus to get the coronavirus spike protein into moss cells. Um, and then they produce this protein. It's um, harvested and mixed it with an immune boost booster that's found in saponin uh, or cell bark trees. And this was exactly when, I know when you were younger, you probably had a hepatitis B injection. Uh, that's exactly, this is the exact process, very similar to what a hepatitis B shot is like. And uh, the genes, so for example, the genes of cells that ingest are altered. 
Um, that's something that's very important. Uh, when we look at future use, uh, like the only the immune system is able to recognize sort of uh, this DNA and this, this recognition. But I think a really important sort of next step for a lot of to mobilize a response faster is getting these non-immune cells to recognize antigens. And those chunks of protein that are left over on the virus, that can really amplify our response. Okay, cool. And this is just sort of a last graphic that I wanted to show you guys, sort of covering the things that I talked about, the vector vaccines, the protein subunit vaccines, the whole kill vaccines. Um, I, I think this is a really good, if you want, guys want to look at this, it covers sort of everything I talked about in a nice graphic. Um, but yeah, that, that's all I have. Cool. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. That's that's the okay. end of our presentation. Um, we have the game night tonight, so there's a nutty clip. Uh, you know, uh, you might you might see some of the stuff. Um, this is me, a best jet and a headshot. Yeah, um, I always carry them though. So yeah, yeah. Th thank you so much, guys, for coming. Um, if you guys have any questions, leave it in the chat. We're gonna try to do our best to answer them. Remember that at the end of the day, we're still high school students. Um, we don't have like an expertise in this field, but we're we're well read and we're going to try our best. So why don't we look at the chat, Krish? Cool. So I got an interesting question. How do I install lock Reina so fast? I so... don't know if that's really relevant. To the topic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. We skipped that one. Uh, okay. Yeah. What makes this upper rep respiratory? Oh, wait, actually, I think I saw one earlier. Um, I saw this. I think I saw someone. Yeah. So this chicken noodle soup help with COVID. So chicken noodle soup, uh, I can't, I don't know if this is a legitimate question, but Chicken noodle soup is actually good for clearing up congestion in the body and actually clears a lot of the symptoms um, that you face in COVID. So that's why um, a lot of your instructor to drink chicken noodle soup, it, the warmth sort of attracts these immune system cells um, throughout your body. Um, okay. Um, okay, one of the biggest concerns facing health is the availability of medical. Um... Um, Camilla, I'm a little confused. Uh, CS, yeah, what's the question? What's, what's the question? It's yeah. critical to be able to provide oxygen and mechanics. The U.S. only has 16, 160,000 ventilators available. Okay. Or just not to send it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Camilla was talking a little bit about the uh, ventilator aspect. That's very true. Um, as we talked about COVID affects some of these organs, such as your lungs. Um, I've actually read a quick article about some of these auto manufacturers that are repurposing their machinery to develop, mach uh, to develop ventilators for the hospital service. But we definitely got to do a better job. I I think it's really cool. A lot of, you've probably heard in the news, a lot of companies are converting their manufacturing facilities to be PP um, generators, which are like masks and uh, ventilators, which I think is really cool. And the, and the government's do, trying to do its best to sort of yeah. um, make these topics, these, more, these resources available. Um, I think that's another question. What makes this upper rep respiratory infection caused by RNA virus any different from hundreds of other uh, so it's not actually an RNA virus. Um, the reason it's different, I think it goes back to a lot of things that Nish talked about with the different call to arms and call to reinforcement mechanisms. I think the main reason it's been so sort of um, global is because it's so easily spread. I think I watched this really interesting um, Bill Gates talk. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this. Um, it's, a, it's about 2014, 2017. Um, it's a tech talk where Bill Gates talk about, talks about the greatest threat to the human population in the next couple of years will be a virus, will be some kind of global pandemic that's going to hurt us. And his sort of prediction came came true. So that was really cool. That's a really interesting tech talk that I think you guys should check out if you're interested. It's, um, yeah, go God. no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, it's not actually an RNA virus. So the reason it's different is mainly because the r not value that I talked about earlier and the fact that it's spread so quickly and spread through so many different avenues. Um, yeah, go ahead, Anish. Yeah, it's it's a combination of things. Why is this so deadly? Uh, it goes back to its its um, transmittability, its mortality rates, and how it actually acts in the immune system. Ebola, for example, has a very high mortality rate, but it's not that easily spread. So while there was the Ebola pandemic uh, a couple years back, or there's the Zika virus pandemic a couple years back, uh, those definitely had debilitating uh, effects, but they really weren't as easily spread, and the populations which they were weren't as susceptible. For example. COVID kind of hits that sweet spot, um, obviously, like uh, negatively speaking, um, in which it is very easily spread because some because ACE protein is found in almost everyone. It's crucial to the workings of lungs and kidney. Um, it also has a very ingenious and simple way of using uh, the spike proteins to enter the cell. And it's a unique way of altering the immune system. So it kind of goes against itself in, in a similar way that an autoimmune disease kind of works, right? It uses the immune system to kind of hurt itself. I, I think um, something, yeah. yeah. 
I think something interesting to talk about with Zika virus is uh, one of the main, uh, I guess, target demographics is like pregnant women, right? Uh, how would it affect newborn babies? And I think with uh, coronavirus affecting really the upper bracket of our age group, it's been a lot more deadly, right? Because them in general uh, have a lot, I guess, um, weaker immune systems, right? So when that virus attacks them, they have a lot of different um, responses. I think that's why uh, it's been sort of very, a lot of deaths. Um, I see a lot of lot of Google copy paste. A lot of I've actually read this last one. It's from a um, bio bio passage, AP bio uh, FRQ. Um, um, uh, Do you like have any me. questions not related to Valorant, or should we start answering Valorant questions, or what? We we have a few. Are, are midgets like me more susceptible to getting COVID? No. But no, I don't. I don't think uh, I've heard a lot of talk about pandemics becoming more frequent in the future. Why is this true? I don't have a complete answer to this, but I've heard it's because um, of like globalization definitely leads to it. People are becoming um, closer and closer community wise. There's a lot more travel, um, a lot more spread. Uh, so that definitely contributes um, to it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure climate change, I read a little bit about how climate change allows for viruses to kind of proliferate in um, certain environments better uh, because you know the world is becoming warmer in general. I think another big issue is, um, especially in America, there's a culture of uh, giving away antibacterials and things like that relatively easily, mm. especially with doctors. Um, and that allows a lot of these viruses to develop re resistances. Um, I'm sure in your biology classes, you've talked about MRSA and some of those things, but as these viruses develop re resistance, um, a lot of new different strains emerge, right? Like every time we shut down a strain, there's a reason you have to get a different flu shot every year, right? Because every year our, the flu virus is constantly adapting to the, uh, to the different vaccine that we're coming out with. So I think, I don't expect COVID to go away any soon. This is obviously opinion, but I think COVID will be a sort of thing. It's, it's in so many people, it's adapted. We've, we already have so many strains. It'll be something like the flu virus, right? Uh, we might have to get a shot every year, uh, maybe something like that to keep our population safe. So I think things like that become really important when we're talking about um, and becoming more frequent. Uh, I hear Pygmalion there could be some ancient virus trapped in ice that global warming might release. Yeah, that's a great point. I also read an article about that, and I think they found something like the bubonic plague remnants. Of yeah, that. Um, I, I, I saw that in the cemetery, I think. I read. Super scary uh, to think about. Was there any more uh, questions related to COVID that we have, Krish? Uh, I can't there's see. One, not letting me scroll all the way up. Eric, there's, one more. Uh, there's one. Would a massive people uh, breaking social distancing mask wearing after getting vaccinated cause another wave? So the thing about getting vaccinated is it relieves the system systems, right? It doesn't mean that you're not a carrier. So um, just because you're, you've gotten vaccinated, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to spread it throughout the population. Um, and for people who can't afford to get, uh, like, can't afford to get the actual vaccine, that's why getting a, um, that's why getting like herd immunity built up in the population is so important, right? Because we want the elder bracket who can't necessarily get a vaccine for whatever reason to be safe. Um, because no one else has symptoms or is expressing them. And that herd immunity number, I think is at 95% right now. Um, but that number may be wrong. So I apologize okay. if it is. But as Chris pointed out, just because you get the vaccine does not mean you're not a carrier anymore. You're still a threat and you're still uh, other people around you who haven't gotten the vaccine are susceptible. Um, I guess that brings up some qualms kind of about the Super Bowl coming up where, you know, you have so many people gathering together and the reality is the vaccine could still be spread. But that's kind of a different conversation. Should people be wary of getting a vaccine, given that the long-term side effects of the vaccine are still unclear? That's a great question, Alan. I was also reading about that. Um, so I think I think there's two distinctions to be made. There's some people who are anti-vax, uh, anti-vax, and there's some people who are, you know, just vaccine war uh, war wary, right? They understand that the long-term effects haven't really been discovered. When it comes to the vaccination effort, um, the COVID vaccine is not coming like out of new, right? So like, you hear about Project Lightspeed and how like it's been produced the fast fastest virus of all time. Um, we're not cutting corners in the scientific department. SARS is not a new uh, it's not a new virus. It's been around since 2011 when another outbreak occurred. The same technology that's used to combat SARS, those strains of SARS viruses are just the same ones, same technology that's being used to combat um, COVID right now, uh, as in terms of you know spike pr spike proteins and stuff like that. Um, so when it comes to you know being wary of the science behind the current vaccine, I I don't I personally don't think, um, and most science consensus agrees, there's no reason uh, to be wary about the short-term effects. Exactly. The, lo the long-term side effects, though, I think there is some uh, notion to be worried. Those aren't shown, but it also says that long-term effects aren't really uh, occurring in other vaccines. Long-term effect in vaccines for flu, for example, tends to be five weeks after. 
and I, after is definitely a measurable rate. So we wouldn't. So, so sorry to interrupt, but I think an yeah, important distinction here is a lot of people are worried because it's a it's a quote unquote new mechanism, the mRNA vaccine. But I think something important to note is that the mRNA vaccine has been in research for years. It's been in the works for years. So just because it's come out recently and this is the first virus where it's been used on, that doesn't necessarily mean that experts haven't been working on it for years and years to make sure it's safe. I think one concern is, um, what if the virus, what if the mRNA somehow gets into my own genes and edits my genes? That's, I think a lot of experts have come to the consensus that's that's not really a problem. No, so that's consensus. It does, it's literally not how it works. I, I've also heard the same thing. Some, some people are like, oh, are you worried about the vaccine changing your RNA? Change your RNA. How, how can it change your RNA? RNA is a derivative of DNA. And RNA is constantly being deleted and the virus doesn't even alter your DNA. It literally just kills the virus. Yeah. That's his task. And, and I, hopefully from our presentation, you can now, you know, tell people if this, if they say something like you can say, you know, here's how the virus actually works. And this is why vaccines are safe. And something important also is it's been in the works since like February. There haven't been any corners cut with clinical trials, right? Uh, there's been hundreds of human subjects. There's been, it's been approved by the FDA. It's been in the works for months. Uh, I remember getting news of it in November, but it's probably in the works since March, right? It's been a full year where the whole scientific community developed the most, like investing their whole time into this, right? So if there, ha I, I would do our best. I think me and Nisha are obviously high schoolers, but I think you can really put a lot of faith in the larger scientific community. Um, and, and when it comes to Project Lightspeed, I was talking about before, the reason why it happened so fast is because so many companies were rushing to find the vaccine, there was no lack of capital, usually lack of capital or money, right, is kind of the is kind of the hindrance. That's what causes the vaccine development to slow down because they have to they have to get funding, they have to test on a population. If it doesn't work, then they have to try it again. There was no cutting corners there. They had government support, um, industrial support, and that's what made it go so fast. I also see um, 